Sorry about that. That's okay. Okay. A red light. I mean, all right. Don't. Take two, right? <laughs> All right, uh, so just a reminder that the uh, meeting is being recorded. So anything as said in the meeting or shared via uh, webcam or in the chat box is part of this recording. Uh, this recording is also displayed on the Bureau's website. Just a reminder about that as well. Uh, when not speaking, please keep your phone or computer on mute. And if attending by telephone only, press star six to unmute yourself. Uh, Shelly and Julia are monitoring the chat box for questions. For everyone's benefit, please identify yourself uh, before stating your remarks so we can capture who's speaking for the record. Uh, next up, we will go to roll call, Shelly. All right. Uh, Daniel Spate. I'm here. Franco Castro Marin. I see that he has joined. I'm here, sorry. Was Frank muted. Walter. Here. Gail Bradley. Present. Jason Johnson. Here. Joshua Gaither. Present. Julie Augenstein. Present. Kevin Foster. Michelle Preston. Present by phone. Ryan Page. I count eight, we do have quorum. Thank you, everybody. All right, excellent. Thank you very much, Shelley. Uh, just a reminder to everyone for chair report, the attendance report is included in your packet. If you miss two or more consecutive meetings, uh, someone from the Bureau will reach out to you to ensure that you still would like to participate in this committee. Uh, for the vacancy report, uh, there are currently uh, a couple vacancies, vacancy for physicians specializing in cardiac care and vacancy for physicians specializing in acute head injury slash spinal cord care. Uh, to apply, you would submit your application on the governor's website. It's bc.azgovernor.gov. Uh, these rules are all appointed by uh, the governor and the term is for three years. Uh, next, I want to just speak briefly about uh, naloxone leave behind. I believe most uh, participants today were on the last meeting with EMS Council, uh, but I will try to summarize rather briefly. Uh, one of the focuses of both the Bureau and ADHS as a whole is the opioid epidemic. Uh, we've seen continued opioid overdoses and deaths throughout the COVID pandemic, and it seems like those numbers are increasing slightly. Uh, one of the avenues that can be implemented to help really address this is naloxone leave behind. Uh, this is something that can be implemented. When I first heard that term, I was not sure kind of what it referred to. I was thinking is EMS leaving their, not, their leftover naloxone or Narcan on scene? And it's certainly not that. It really gives EMS the opportunity to distribute naloxone with associated education to either the patient they're caring for, uh, bystanders, family, or friends. Uh, these programs have been implemented in many other parts of the country. And in Southern Arizona, Dr. Uh, Glenn from uh, Bain University, Tucson, uh, did implement a program uh, in Santa Cruz County with some good success. So we're really trying to get the messaging out there. The Education Committee has put together a training PowerPoint on naloxone leave behind that will go to the committee in July for final approval. Uh, once that gets approved, we will make that available along with the uh, statute that allows this to be performed and administered in the pre-hospital setting. The Office of Injury Prevention, which is another division in uh, ADHS, also has an opportunity for EMS providers to get free naloxone. Uh, we have this displayed here on the website as well. So once that program is ready to go, we will make sure we share this information as well. So we just wanted to make sure we keep getting that messaging out, uh, really an opportunity for EMS to help uh, continue address the opioid epidemic. Are there any questions or comments uh, regarding the naloxone leave behind program? Yeah, well, this is Dave. Um, does that naloxone program also allow law enforcement to request an IOA? Uh, the law, law enforcement is a different arm, so they can re uh, request uh, through that program, but in order to administer it, they have to complete the training through AC Post. Uh, we do have plenty of naloxone via the FR CARE grant. Uh, that that uh, naloxone does require the law enforcement personnel to go through the training uh, that is part of the uh, FR CARE grant. Any other questions or comments? 
All right, thank you. I will go ahead and turn the computer over here to Chief Garcia. I can't see, I'm guessing that you, hopefully you can see her and I don't have this in an odd angle since we can't see the screen, so. All right. Yes, I can see her. Perfect, <laughs> thank you. Good morning or good afternoon at this point. Um, in in um, opening, we just wanted to say in honor of EMS week and Trauma Awareness Month, um, a big thank you to all of our EMS and trauma providers on the front lines. We appreciate you and we thank you for your service. Um, I'll touch on a few updates. Apologies for everyone that's had to listen to me say this more than once. Um, we have some staffing transitions going on. Um, the Bureau has several vacant positions that are currently posted on our jobs website and open accepting applications. We still have the non-regulatory services section chief position open. This was formerly held by Ben Fisher and we're working on adding an additional position that will be focused on health equity and public health initiatives. Um, some bureau updates that have been sent out most recently through our gov delivery system are after surveys and discussions with stakeholders, the bureau is prepared to implement a fully online um, certification process. That includes the issuance of digital certification cards only starting July 1st. We'll make sure to keep our Bureau Online Services website up to date with more information as we approach July 1st. Recently, CMS released a waiver that has allowed Medicare reimbursement for treatment in place due to COVID-19, effective retroactive all the way back to March 1st, 2020. There's also been new legislation, Senate Bill 1377, that ensures that Arizonans acting in good faith during the pandemic are protected against civil claims. This legislation replaces the former Good Samaritan executive order that also provided protections to our frontline responders. Administrative order 2020-15 previously provided limited EMS rule waivers and that did sunset on March 31st, 2021. However, emergency measure 2020-05 continues to authorize all levels of EMCTs to administer both COVID testing, viral testing, and also administer COVID and flu vaccinations. That will continue to be in effect um, for up to 18 months. We'll keep our ADHS website up to date with additional EMS guidelines and information. Um, and we expect that the Arizona surge line will continue to remain active. Um, they are currently providing consultation to providers and also still facilitating transfers of COVID patients. I'll add that um, we apologize for the delay, but we are still waiting on um, our appropriation for regional councils for the coming fiscal year. At this time, we expect that um, funding will return to the level that it was in 2019, and that will be without supplemental grant funds at this time. A few more rule updates for Article 5. ADHS has submitted an exception request for exempt rulemaking, and that is to update the EMS scope of practice, Table 5.1. We, we're hoping that it will now be consistent with both best practices and national standards based on the recommendations that were provided by the Medical Direction Commission. There's been no record of approval yet from the governor's office. We expect that there will be a public comment review period and that um, we'll, we'll keep the committees updated, of course, on the progress related to the scope of practice update. For Articles 9 and 11, the department continues to seek feedback on the ground ambulance rules. We encourage everyone to visit the website um, and to look at the upcoming rural work group meetings. The next rural meeting will be set at June 23rd is the new date we've rescheduled that meeting for. The department is currently seeking feedback through some surveys that are open online through June. And per administrative council and rules, um, there are at least a few definitions that we are seeking additional feedback on in those ground ambulance rules. If any of the committee members would like to provide feedback, um, they can respond through the surveys that are open online, or I believe we have Ruth Ann also joining us on the phone um, to be able to provide some more information during the, the public comment period of this meeting. Um, I believe that is all I have for now. Um, I'll go ahead and end report and thank you all for your service. Thank you. Are there any questions for Chief Garcia? All right, thank you. Uh, we will move on to a report from Vatsal on opioid and out-of-hospital cardiac arrest data.
I don't see her online. Uh, all right, not a problem. I can uh, go through this as well. Uh, so we just wanted to continue to demonstrate some of the uh, data that you can see presented here. As I'm sure anyone who was around EMS in January or the hospital knows, our uh, cardiac arrest numbers, especially in January, are quite high. Uh, these numbers have stayed elevated. Uh, you can see the years there. If you can scroll down a little bit further, Shelley. Uh, you can see the years at the bottom. So we have 2018 through 2021. Uh, and then if you scroll down to the bottom graph, uh, the cardiac arrest rates per 100,000. Uh, sorry, the, oop, it's jumping there. <laughs> uh, the, yep, right there. So you can see if you look at the bottom line there, the cardiac arrest per 100,000, so kind of adjusting for population changes, uh, you can see that there has been a, a kind of a slow increase from 2018 through 2020, uh, but we did see the uh, a bigger jump uh, when you correct for the population in 2021 uh, year to date. Uh, perfect, Botsla is there. I will hand it over to her. <laughs> Sorry. Not a problem. So we did the cardiac arrest incidents increase over uh, every uh, month post pre-COVID and during COVID. We, we did that, right? Yes, yes. but we can revisit right. it. Thank okay, you. so the number of the transports, and as we see, ah, thank you. Yeah. Um, what we are observing is that the people are not opting, the patients are not opting for going to the hospitals. And that's what we are seeing in your 2020 and 2021. You know, if you've seen the January, 39% uh, were transported to the hospital as compared to the last we can see it's almost half of the patients, like 48 to 46 and 45% and now 39%. So we, we, the, the, the trend still is continuing is less people are getting transported to the hospital compared to pre-COVID period. And then we can now go to the opioid. For opioid, suspected opioid overdoses, what um, we are observing is we are not seeing any pattern or any increase or decrease kind of a trends over the, over the time. But what we are saying is that around 1,000 to 900 to 1,000 cases per month of suspected opioid overdoses cases being reported in EZP years. And that has remained in that range. <clears throat> and, and the opioid over deaths are also kind of in the range of 3 to 4% deaths are happening per month. Um, yeah. So there's a little bit of variation here and there, but I think the ballpark is that around 4% of death is happening every month with the, because of the opioid. And I think that's about it. Hey, Gail, this is Dan. Can I, can I say something? Absolutely, Dan. Thank you. Um, first, thanks, Fossil, as always. Um, so wonderful to have a bonafide biostatistician and epidemiologist at the at the department Thanks, yeah. really really helps um, but um, it, Shelley can you scroll back to the um, uh, the uh, showing the trend toward the the, the highest uh, year of cases um, during COVID um, yeah one thing that's in, that is important is the the trend the, the year before um, in our partnership with the DHS at, at the U of A, we really, really were pressing into uh, working hard at getting all of the, as many missing cases from both hospitals and EMS as before. And we actually got way more up to date with our data than we had ever previously been. So if you just, if you just looked at that from the back of the room and you might say, well, you know, actually it's just a trend up every year. So maybe this is just a trend, but the reality is the, um, the trend upward for the last two years uh, was really because we were capturing more cases. So that's worth noting, because if you just handed that to a biostatistician with no other information, they might say, well, it's just a trend upward. But probably COVID is an actual true anomaly, whereas the previous increases were a very intentional um, getting rid of the backlog log and making sure we count all the cases. 
Thank you, Dan. Gail, this is Shari Brand. I have a quick question. Um, Vansel, um, for the opioid epidemic stuff, do you know where we relate to um, our numbers relate to other states, like other parts of the country? No, we haven't done the comparison with the other states. I, this is Anne. I do think that from the two other states I've heard on national meetings, that they have seen an overlay of increase in cardiac arrest and COVID peaks, but I haven't seen anything as to previous year's data. Thank you, Shari. Any other questions for Watzel or Anne? So we're gonna probably continue uh, sharing these reports at this meeting. We think it's really important data and definitely helps to have insight uh, and expertise just, such as Dr. Spate uh, when you look at this data. So thank you everyone for uh, letting us take some time to present that. I also wanted to say a big thank you to all the EMS providers and agencies. Uh, without you providing the data uh, to us and AZ peers, we wouldn't have access to this information. Uh, so we really appreciate the fact that you're able to provide us this data and be able, and which allows us to essentially build these reports. So big thank you regarding that. Uh, next, we will move on to standing and committee reports. Uh, first up for Tepi is Dr. Augustin. Can you hear me okay, Gail? I can, thank you, Julie. Okay, great. Um, at the last meeting in March, I believe, there um, the chairman's report included a vacancy for the role of Air Ambulance Premier EMS Agency Quality Improvement Officer. Of discussion and action items. The main standing item was a discussion regarding uh, the sequence for discretionary reports. Um, and Dr. Bradley had acknowledged that reports have not been generated from this list. However, some of the data from cardiac arrest, COVID, and opiate overdose has been shared with future reports, combining those along with transport refusal rates. Um, for updates, there was no update from the trauma registry users group. Um, nor was there one for the EMS registry user group. The other um, big agenda item from the last meeting was um, Miss, uh, sorry if I'm pronouncing her name wrong, uh, Leah from InTouch Senior Services had requested to discuss or get data for concerns of residential care facility cardiac arrest, CPR, and lift assist calls as compared to skilled nursing facilities or assisted living facilities. And um, Dr. Bradley had indicated that this data request would need to go uh, would need to be submitted to the data request team and wasn't sure if the AC peers data set would collect all of those items. Um, there was no um, outstanding action items from the call to the public and I believe the next meeting will be July 15th. That was it for Tepi. Thank you, Julie. Uh, next up, Josh for education committee meeting. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bradley. Uh, Education Committee, real briefly, uh, Dr. Rice welcomed a new member, Mr. Chris uh, Ramos. They went over the PACES trait management training and created two new work groups, uh, one for updating the LVAT patient care module and uh, second for a leave-behind Narcan training module. That's it for the education group. Thank you. Uh, next, you're up again, Josh, for PMD. Okay. Sorry, I did not mean to raise my hand. I just hit the wrong button. Uh, <laughs> PMP. Uh, Dr. Kastamaran welcomed a new member, Dr. O'Connor. Uh, they gave a brief update on the new Misimso guidelines, which you mentioned previously, Dr. Bradley. Um, and then, as was also mentioned previously, there was a discussion regarding cardiac arrest, the share database, and the new arrest program. Uh, that was it for PMD. All right, thank you. And next up, we have Julia for PACES. Um, hello, everybody. So for PACES, just a couple of updates. We do have one vacancy on PACES for an emergency physician. Um, at the last meeting, we did get our tracheostomy management training approved, and that is posted on the website. We also discuss, discussed potential upcoming projects, which include naloxone for pediatric patients, as well as pediatric behavioral health. Um, we also 
talked about the National EMS Survey, which concluded in March. I thank you to everybody that participated in that. We received over 75 responses from agencies. Currently, the National Pediatric Readiness Project assessment is going on, which is a similar assessment among emergency departments. Um, so you might see information about that if you work in an ED, and we thank you for your participation. That's all. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Julia. Uh, next for discussion and action items, can I get a motion to discuss, amend, and approve the meeting minutes from January? So moved, Frank. Thank you, Frank. Can I get a second, please? Michelle, second. Thank you, Michelle. Are there any recommended amendments to the minutes? Okay, hearing none, uh, we will start with any oppositions. Anyone who is not uh, in favor of approving the minutes as displayed, please say nay. Hearing none, will any abstentions? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, excellent. Meeting minutes are approved. Thank you. Uh, next up, if I can get a motion to discuss, amend, and approve updating the triage treatment and transport guideline for implanted ventricular assist devices. So moved, Jason. Thank you, Jason. Can I get a second, please? Second, Frank. Thank you, Frank. So to give a little bit of background on this, the Education Committee was updating the training PowerPoint on ventricular assist devices and total artificial hearts. Uh, we were very fortunate to have participation from the various uh, VAD centers across the state and the VAD coordinators. And they had recommended and said that we needed to make some significant updates to bring uh, both the curriculum as well as the treatment guideline up to date with some newer technology and uh, treatment recommendations. As part of that training PowerPoint, we recognize that the current uh, uh, algorithm did not really address total artificial hearts and also that made the recommendation to make some updates. So rather than to continue to have kind of outdated treatment guidelines on the website, we wanted to go ahead and update these. So that's just a little bit of background on why we're bringing this in kind of mid-cycle of the TTTG process. So uh, one of the key pieces here is the exclusion at the top is uh, total artificial hearts. That's gonna take you to its own guideline now. And uh, a big thank you to Dr. Rice, who's on the meeting. She uh, spearheaded the educational training uh, group and really was instrumental in kind of getting this updated. So uh, Amber, please speak up while where you see changes and then we'll kind of scroll down a little bit, uh, please Shelley. We added in Phoenix Children's Hospital as they do have a VAD program, so we wanted to make sure that we added that telephone number as well. And we can scroll down a little bit further, please, Shelley. I think in this part, Gail, I'd only point out that we um, specify in this one not to administer nitroglycerin, which is why one of the reasons why we created the second uh, guideline to be able to address the difference in treatment with total artificial heart. So that's why this is bolded there. Thank you, Amber. I think we also made a little bit of changes to the IV fluid bolus, correct? Yeah, at the recommendation of the VAD centers and that many of these patients um, would not it, have a fluid bolus indicated or that could be harmful to them if they had certain types of, you know, right heart failure, for instance. So um, they really would prefer, I think that fluids not be given or significant amount unless, um, you know, unless it, it's like really indicated. So I think they would wanted it just to be a little more strongly work bolus. Amber, uh, I, I believe I understand what the push-pull method is. Is that pretty universal terminology that the medics 
the AMTs will understand? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Okay. And that would be preferred over a pressure bag? Uh, I don't think it would really matter. I think you could certainly do a pressure bag as well. I don't know if you want to put that in there or, or not. Up to you. Because this says that's basically the only way to do it. I don't think it's a problem to add push pull or pressure bag. Yeah, whatever want. whatever you think is best. Yeah, I think they're fairly interchangeable. Right, so I, I here recommend a change. So using a push pull method or pressure bag. Yes. Any other recommended changes or adjustments? I think the key kind of teaching point with this was really we encourage the uh, EMS personnel to contact the VAD coordinator for that patient right up front. Uh, they typically know their patients, their comorbidities, their underlying status very well. And so we really want that to be kind of the caveat as a part of the treat, uh, the actual training is really focusing on that. Uh, just recognizing that they're the best ones to make that determination. Uh, also, Amber, I don't know if you want to speak briefly on just the CPR language and some of that verbiage as well that was discussed. Are you talking to me, Gail? I missed you, Josh was... Sorry. <laughs> Not a problem. Uh, I just said, I don't know if you wanted to speak to the CPR uh, language that we discussed. I just I think there was a little bit of update on that uh, based on the latest AHA recommendations as well. Yeah, so we had, we had talked uh, to the VAD centers about performing CPR on patients with um, LVADs, and um, it seems like the AHA's newest recommendations include a recommendation to do CPR when the pump's not working and when the end tidal CO2 is low, but we did not end up putting that in there. Um, they just said if the pump is truly not working um, and all the troubleshooting efforts have failed, um, then, then you can do CPR. Um, otherwise, call the VAD coordinator and, and they'll help you with that, with that issue. But before, I think it was, we didn't have anything in here about when you could potentially initiate CPR, even though they still prefer you to call. Um, they, we did sort of list in here, you know, really when you would consider doing CPR. And it's only for the LVADs. It's not included for the total artificial hearts. I don't know if Thank that makes sense. But. Yes. Any further questions or discussion items on this one? Can I get a motion to approve with the amended change from Dr. Walter on adding or pressure bag verbiage in? So moved, Frank. Thank you. And a second, please. Second, Jason. Thank you, Jason. All right. Any opposed to approving the updated VAD treatment guideline? Please say nay. Any abstentions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Thank you very much. That is approved. Uh, next on the agenda, can I get a motion to discuss, amend, and approve? Uh, a treatment, Trash Treatment Transport Guideline for Total Artificial Heart. So moved, Franco. Thank you, Franco. Can I get a second? Second, Frank. Thank you, Frank. Uh, so I think uh, Amber teed this up quite nicely. Uh, we did have uh, kind of brought forward from the, the VAD coordinators uh, who do call themselves VAD coordinators despite also having the Total Artificial Hearts. Uh, that this is a little different patient population and should be carved out separately. 
Um, so we're just going to go ahead and quickly uh, scroll slowly through that. If you see at the top, we really want to make this clear, patients no longer have a native heart. Uh, and I think that is um, comes into play with some of the recommendations lower down. This has the key carve out, never perform CPR for total artificial heart patients. Amber, I don't know if you wanted to speak on that. Yeah, I think just because they don't have an actual heart at all. So there's be no role for CPR. And what they had discussed was that if the pump had stopped functioning for some reason, truly, uh, that the patient would only have a matter of a very short number of minutes before they are no longer survivable. So um, if CPR, I mean, it, even if you got there, the time it would take, the transport time or the response time from the EMS agency would likely be too long even um, to be survivable. So there really is many reasons why there's no role for CPR in these patients. Thank you. And scroll down a little further then. And then same thing, and I, I hope this part's clear where it says if patients experiencing complications, um, this is really kind of listed in order of preference. So hopefully that's clear in here. So um, preference is the TH program and then the nearest TH trained facility, if not their program, and then the next appropriate facility. Um, and some of this has to do with, you know, questions that came up regarding, you know, whether or not the patient was involved in a trauma or had some kind of completely unrelated problem um, that may require them to go to a different facility. And these patients similarly can get a fluid bolus, uh, but many of them can't get nitroglycerin. So you'd only give that after consultation. So just to make that clear. Would you want to put in uh, first preferences, his or her TH program, next uh, best would be nearest, or, or an alternate would be, or, or uh, Next choice would be nearest TH trained to fit and uh, last choice uh, would be nearest appropriate facility. If you want to make it clearer, obviously I think they'd, they'd want to go to their TH program, but we see people getting brought to hospitals that are closer uh, occasionally just for convenience rather than express patient wish. Totally up to you. Yeah, I'm okay with either verbiage. We were trying to keep it as concise as possible. So I think as long as people understand it, I'm okay with the way it is, but I can see where it could be misread, but. I'll defer to the wisdom of the group. Gail, it's, uh, it's Shari Brent. Um, Quick question, did you want to, for the never perform CPR, do you want to bold that? I mean, when we're saying never, that's a really big thing to say. So I think that should be, that should be drawn to their eyes. We've got nitro bolded, but I think that may be a good one. Great point, Shari. And then uh, do you want to also add in uh, Frank's recommendation under the AMT section? So using push-pull method or pressure bag for consistency? Yeah, I think that sounds good. Agreed. And, and you may want to put never perform CPR for TH patients at the very end, because uh, if you're not going to perform CPR, you, you won't need their uh, equipment bag. Or maybe the bold is, is, is plenty. And we did uh, also receive one other uh, clarification from Ryan Smith, uh, just to keep these consistent. Uh, typically, even if there aren't separate interventions, uh, just to have the color line for EMTI slash paramedic underneath the AEMT box. 
uh, just for consistency. So with the other guidelines, we still list that. So it's clear that we're at least including that. Dr. Bradley, it's Brian. Yes. While I'm sitting here reading this, I actually did find something that may be appropriate down there. Uh, up, okay. in, in, up in EMT, it says patient will have a pulse, but no electrical activity on EKG, which is not within the scope of practice for an EMT to do ECG. So maybe it would be more appropriate to put patient will have a pulse if the device is working properly and then down in the IEMT paramedic section put uh, EKG slash um, there will be no electrical activity. Would that be under AEMT as well? I'd have to go back and look at scope. No. IEMT 99 and paramedics. But what about the regular like three lead monitor? Would that not be in the AEMT scope of practice? No. Okay. Just a question under universal care, would that include CPR or no? No. Okay, thanks. So I want to make sure we capture the recommended changes correctly. So under EMT, we're recommending a patient will have a pulse period. Is that correct, Ryan? If, if the device is working properly. Okay. So if device is working, period. And then would we just take that whole bullet and move it under the EMTI and paramedic section? Yeah, you could put e e K EKG and then uh, there will be no electrical activity on EKG or something like, however. Or I guess you could just put, simply put under there, there will be no electrical activity on EKG. Would it be reasonable to say on cardiac monitor? That would be appropriate. Yeah, that's where I was going with my earlier question, because I think it would be the three lead or the EKG, so. Yeah, that sounds good, Amber. Cardiac monitor or EKG. The version I'm looking at that I downloaded just has EMT and AEMT. Uh, maybe something got cut off. I don't no, know. And that's uh, that was the pickup that Brian had uh, sent via email. Was that underneath this? We typically had that. We didn't have any specific treatment components, so we forgot to add that in. So he had picked up. So we need to add in kind of the the salmon colored line that covers EMTI and paramedic, and then underneath that we would add in. They would quote there would be no electrical activity on cardiac monitor. Thank you. All right, any further recommended amendments? Can I get a motion to approve the uh, total artificial heart guideline with the amendments as discussed? So moved, Frank. Thank you, Frank. Can I get a second? Second, Jason. Thank you, Jason. Uh, any and anyone who is opposed to approving uh, the total artificial heart guideline, please say nay. All right, hearing none, any abstentions? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the total artificial heart guideline with recommended amendments, please say aye. 
Aye. Aye. All right. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you, big thank you to Amber for all her work on getting this uh, pushed through that work group. All right, uh, next up is uh, agenda items to be considered for next meeting. Are there any items that the group would like added to our next committee meeting, which will be coming up in September? All right, hearing none, I will go to call to the public. If you find yourself muted, if you wiggle your mouse around the bottom of the screen, a menu should pop up. You can unmute your phone, Ruth Ann. <laughs> I see Ruth Ann is on the call. All right, hearing none under call to the public, the summary of current events is uh, displayed as well. These are live links in your online agenda, so feel free to uh, link onto any of those as you would like. Our next meeting will be September 16th at uh, 12 p.m. Location to be determined. Unclear if we will con uh, continue virtual only option. Uh, we will always have a virtual option, but determination on in-person will be made closer to that meeting. Uh, if there's no further discussion or items, well, I just need a motion to adjourn, please. Uh, Gail, uh, yes. may I add a uh, link to upcoming advanced asthmat life support uh, courses in the chat? Absolutely. Thank you, and, Frank. And maybe that uh, can be added to those upcoming events. And I would move to close then. And, and thank you all. Thank you, Frank. I see your link in the chat box there. Can I get a second? Second, Jason. Thank you, Jason. All right, meeting is up, uh, adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a good day. Thank you all.